worship team. Hallelujah. Amen. Isaiah chapter 63. And we're going to be looking at verses 7 to 10, but then we're going to be jumping into Isaiah 64 as well and uh, referencing of a few scriptures there. And when I was a kid, and you, you know it's quite a while ago, that, uh, you know, often we would be given Christmas present, uh, and the Christmas present was a book, and it was called the Guinness Book of Records. And there was something that would just, for hours, would just keep your attention. People would, you know, come round and you'd turn around and show them the book and then they would take the book and they would want to read it. Well, I remember when my son Nigel was uh, relatively young and he was not by me, but he was given by another member of the family, uh, amen, the 1999 edition of the Guinness Book of Records. And uh, I had a little snoop through, if I remember rightly. And, uh, you know, in the, the Guinness Book of Red Records, there's some unusual things there. There's some weird things there. You've you got to agree, right? There's some really weird stuff in there. But I came across uh, this one entry. And here is this Guinness Book of Records. Uh, and... Uh, this one entry is titled, uh, The Longest uh, Time Living in a Tree. Now think about this. Here we have uh, the Guinness Book of Records, uh, and the, the entry is titled, The Longest Time Living in a Tree. It seems, uh, as I read through it, that this man... Amen. He lives in Indonesia. His name is Bunkus, and he went up the tree in 1970. <laughs> Hello. He climbed this tree in 1970, and he's been there ever since. Obviously, this is 1999 edition, and so this man from Indonesia has been living up a tree for 29 years. 29 years. No one knows exactly why he decided to go and live in a tree. No one knows why. But 29 years later, he was still there. Neighbors, friends family have repeatedly tried to get him to come down, but he won't. And I tried to find out whether or not he's come down yet, or even if he's still alive. But I can hear them, his family and friends, urging him, come down, just Come down. But he doesn't budge. Nope. I'm not coming down. I share that this morning because this is an unusual story for our first Sunday of Advent. I got bought an Advent calendar this year. Actually, I got two. And they're hanging in my office at home. And so every day I get two little chocolate treats. But the fact of it is, Advent, my story this morning of the man living in a tree, the neighbors and friends and family telling him to come down, it reminds me, church, of our text from the Old Testament. The prophet Isaiah, he's crying out to God and in Isaiah 64 and verse 1, he tells us, Oh, that you would render heavens and that you would come down. 
that you would come down. And I want to minister this morning a sermon I've entitled, Will You Come Down? Out of Isaiah chapter 63 and verses 7 to 10, if you would be kind enough to follow with me. The Bible says, I will mention the loving kindness of the Lord and the praises of the Lord. According to all that the Lord has bestowed on us and the great goodness towards the house of Israel, which he has bestowed on them according to his mercies, according to the multitude of his loving kindness. For he, sure, he said, surely they are my people, children who will not lie. So he became their savior. In all their affliction, he was afflicted. And the angel of his presence saved them. In his love, in his pity, he redeemed them. And he bore them and carried them all the days of old. But they rebelled and grieved his Holy Spirit. So he turned himself against them as an enemy. And he fought against them. Will you come down? So here we have this morning Isaiah's desperate plea. He is crying out to God. And his plea this morning was the result of a great feeling, if you like, of helplessness in actually the face of two troubling events. The suffering and the sinfulness of God's people. The people of Israel have known, we know, great suffering throughout their history. And it was true that in Isaiah's time, and it was even more true in the 20th century when Adolf Hitler and his Nazi stormtroopers, if you like, put millions of Jews to death. And to a lesser extent, it is still true today. And that is Jews are still under attack. But on the other hand, the Jewish people believe themselves to be a chosen people. They believe that they have a special relationship with God. What about you and I this morning? How is your relationship with God? Do you have a special relationship with God? Because the Jews, amen, they consider themselves to have a special relationship with God. And then on the other hand, there has been times when God seemed very, very, very far away from them. Have you ever felt times when God feels far away? Have you ever felt times that God just seems to be out of reach? He seems to be perhaps busy everywhere else but where you are, right? We've been there, haven't we? And if you like that, here is the Jews... They feel that they have this special relationship with God. By the way, that Christopher Columbus, when he traveled, he turned round and took several Jews with him on his historic voyages. He took them, why? Because he took them as his interpreters. He assumed that any Indians or, or Orientals he would encounter would probably be primitive and would therefore speak God's language. Well, God's language is actually Hebrew, right? That was God's language, Hebrew. We're blessed today. We don't have to speak in Hebrew to understand God. It's been translated for us. We know that Columbus, this was a naive expectation, of course. But it is true that the Jews had this very special relationship with God. 
They thought of themselves as God's chosen people. So the question is, how is it possible, however, to reconcile the notion that we are God's chosen people? Think about the Jews with the reality of six million Jews slain under Adolf Hitler alone. We can appreciate the difficult dilemma faced by a devout Jew today as he or she wrestles with what it means to be a descendant of Abraham in the face of such tragedy. It's like the story that the great writer and Jewish activist Eli Wiesel used to tell. Wiesel himself was a Holocaust survivor and he would tell about a Jewish rabbi during that terrible time. The rabbi would faithfully come to the synagogue each day and pray. He said, I've come to inform you, your master of the universe, that we are here as the toll of slain, deported, missing Jews increased. He still came faithfully and prayed. You see, Lord, we're still here, he'd cry. Finally, he is the only Jew left alive. And with a heart that is numb with grief, he goes to the synagogue once more and prays. You see, I'm still here. Then he sadly, he asks, but you, where are you? Where are you? He's obviously talking to God. And I wonder how many times, church, in a time of personal grief, have we not asked that same question? Have we not asked that same question when you're struggling, when you hear some bad news, when you've been told that you have a, an incurable disease? fact of it is, where were you, God, when my son was in a terrible accident? Where were you, God, when my wife suffered so terribly before succumbing to breast cancer? Or as we view the world's enormous problem, such as an out-of-control virus that has messed up everybody's lives for the last 10 months. Why doesn't God just come down and straighten out the whole mess? Why doesn't he come down? Because if he did come down, there would be no more starvation. There would be no more war, no more oppression, no more sickness, and death, and so I'm sure there are some, well, if your God is real, why doesn't he come down? Isaiah, in our text, he's perhaps the most sensitive of all the prophets of Israel. He's actually struck, and he's stuck also to the very core of his being, that Amen, these people are suffering. Now, I don't like to see people suffer. And just as troubling, however, Isaiah was watching the sinfulness of his people. Listen to what Isaiah prays in Isaiah 64 and verses 6 to 7. But we are all like unclean things, and all our righteousness are like filthy rags. We all fade as a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. And there is no one who calls on your name, who stirs himself up to take hold of you, for you have hidden your face from us. You have consumed us because of our iniquities. Another translation says, all of us have become like one who is unclean. Just remember, this is Isaiah's prayer. He's praying to God. He's saying that all our righteous acts are like 
filthy rags. He's saying that we're all shriveled up like a leaf. Like the wind, our sins sweep us away. So much so that no one calls on your name. That means no one's praying. They've given up. No one is striving to lay hold of you. This is what Isaiah is praying. I mean, God help us when you stop praying. God help us when the Christian stops praying. When they stop laying hold of God. Isaiah is even saying to God, you've hidden your face from us. You've given us over to our sins. God help us, church. Think about this. More than any other faith on the face of the globe, the Jewish faith back in the day is the one of doing right. It was ingrained in them. The Jews were called together as a people to give witness to God's moral laws. They were supposed to be the testimony. Truth of it is, church, they had the law before they had the temple, before they had their homeland. This was their mission. This was the reason for their election to maintain the law. In the beginning, they believed. They believed God created man and woman to live in perfect harmony with creation and with the creator. But something was amiss in the very heart of humanity. Something there was that uh, alienated human beings from their environment, from their fellow human beings, if you like, even from the loving God who created him or created them. And that something, church, was humanity's sinful nature. It was sin that dug, if you like, a, a massive hole or a, a chasm between God and humanity. It was sin that made humanity unacceptable to God. Why? Because the very nature of God is what? Holiness. The very nature of God is righteousness. This is why the psalmist wrote in Psalms 24, verses 3 and 5. Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord, or who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to an idol, nor sworn deceitfully. When that talks about swearing deceitfully, it's talking about those who swear by a false god. You see, church, the law was given to bring light to humanity's dark existence, if you like. But here's where God's people, who were to witness the law, and they were the people with dirty hands... And impure hearts. I mean, I've said all of that to say, that sounds just like us. Right? That sounds just like us. We too are people with dirty hands and impure hearts. I mean, let's be honest. We need more than a little bit of hand cleanser. We need more than a little bit of hand cleanser. Because, church, our hearts are wicked. We're deceitful. We're like the three young men in the Bible Belt many years ago who were actually caught red-handed at breaking the Sabbath. 
guilt-ridden for their sins and fearful of their punishment they will, that they were likely to receive, they stood before the stern pastor. They shook with fear as he asked for an explanation of their behavior and why they wasn't in church. The first young man feeling great guilt, he said, Sir, I was absent-minded, and I forgot that yesterday was the Sabbath. The pastor thought, and he said, Well, that could be true. You could have been absent-minded. You are forgiven. Also very upset, the second young man said he too was absent-minded. He said, I forgot that I was not allowed to gamble on the Sabbath. That was his excuse. And so the pastor turns around and says, well, that also could be true. Well, you are forgiven. Finally, he turns to the third young man whose home these events occurred. He said, what is your excuse? Let me guess. I suppose you were absent-minded too. The young man says, yeah, I sure was. I was absent-minded. This young man is known as the troublemaker. He was actually the instigator of this card game. He said, I was absent-minded because I forgot to pull the shades down and close the curtains. <laughs> I forgot to try to cover my sin. See, there's something about that young man's attitude that strikes at the very core of us. And that is, there are times we like to try and cover things up. There are times in our lives, like with coronavirus, where we just want to pull down the shades and close the curtains. Me, my family, we're pulling down the shade. We're closing the curtains. And this is something, church, that strikes at the very core of all of us. And there's nothing wrong wanting to take care of your family. But I also believe there's a rule that associates professional basketball and there's a saying that if there's no harm, there's no foul. In other words, if you don't get caught, it's all right. If you don't get caught, it's all right. It's okay if no one gets hurt. It's only myself that I'm hurting. So it's my business, isn't it? Why does God have to get involved? Why does the church have to get involved? And somehow, what happens is we act like ancient Israel. Even as Christians today, we have deluded ourselves into thinking that sin is no big deal. Right? Hey, listen, I just made a mistake. Yeah, but you, you made that mistake last week and the week before. Actually, the month before and the year before. See, we have become guilty today of discarding sin. Hey, pastor, there's no harm. There's no one else involved but me and her or her and him or whatever. What's the big deal? Well, we're no different to ancient Israel. Because what happens is, uh, when we allow ourselves to think that sin is no big deal, we actually ignore its power to actually destroy our health and our home. To also damage our testimonies, our witness. Uh, and to slow down spiritual growth in us. See, we discard its power to block our view of God. Did you know that? When you sin, 
amen, you actually disregard the power to block your view of God. And actually what will happen is you actually become a slave to your own passions. And believe it or not, it was actually a warning to us that Jesus taught in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 8. He said, blessed are those that are pure in heart, for they shall see God. In other words, there is something about sin that actually coats your soul with dirt, with grime, and actually prevents you from seeing God. I mean, let's be honest today, it's very rare that people actually listen. They only hear what they want to hear. I've just spoke about sin and how we ignore its power and most of you just heard power. You didn't want to hear that part about sin because you know you're guilty. Because we're all guilty of sin. It's always... The only time we listen is when it's too late. A police officer was watching a young man driving his car backwards in reverse around the tar block of flats where he lived. And then the policeman sat there watching him as he did it again. And then he done it again and again. Finally, the policeman stopped the young man and asked him, why are you driving your car backwards around this tower block? At first, this young youth didn't want to explain the reason for his strange behavior. But eventually, after some questioning by the police officer and being told that, If he didn't tell him, he was going down to the police cells for the night. Eventually admitted that he had borrowed his dad's car for the evening. And because he had driven further than he had promised his dad that he would drive. So in his mind, he was reversing around the tower block to try and take some miles off the mileage. I mean, we can laugh at that. But that's how we look at sin sometimes. We want to backpedal. We want to try and cover it up. Right? We want to try and cover it up. Isaiah, in our text, saw that there was no hope that Israel could save itself from their moral abyss in which it was drifting into. And so the only hope was God would come down and bring healing to his people. I mean, even I pray, God, why don't you sort this virus out? God, let's get rid of corona so we can get back to normality. But we've also got to understand, God knows the beginning to the end. He knows all things. And even though Isaiah is praying, why don't you come down and save us not only from our suffering, but also from our sin? Isaiah is pleading. And it is in this context that he uses a very familiar image to us. Isaiah 64 and verse 8. But now, O Lord, you are our father. We are the clay and you are the potter. And all we are is the work of your Hand.
what Isaiah is saying, he understood and he knew that only God could remove the flaw from the fragile clay of humanity. He understood that. And that is the second reason that Isaiah cried out for God to come down. The sinfulness of God's people. But there's one more thing to say, then I'm closing. And that is this. God has come down. Hello. God has come down. I mean, people crying out, God, come down. That man living in the tree, why don't you just come down? 29 years later, why don't you just come down? Family, friends, neighbors, why don't you come down from that tree? Well, I want to declare to you this morning, God has already come down. He's already come down. And that, of course, is what Advent is all about. That's what it's all about. From beyond time and space, if you like, down past the the galaxies and all the heavenly ferments. In the event uh, that surpasses our grandest uh, attempt to get our little brains around it. And that is God has come down. God is already here. And we know when we look at history, he came down in a little obscure town outside of Jerusalem. In a little stable. He came as a tiny baby, born to a humble couple who actually came from a backward village called Nazareth. See, God has come down, church. And that which Isaiah prayed for has happened. God has come down in the person of Jesus And he is the answer to all humanity's suffering and sin. There's a story told by the late Dr. John Claypool about a play written in 1945 by a a German pastor named Gunther Rutenborn. The story was set at a time when Germany was still reeling from the tragic impact of World War II. Many people in Germany were agonizing with the question of who was responsible for the terrible agony that the Second World War had brought upon the world. Characters in the play voiced their opinions of those who were looking for answers. Was it Adolf Hitler alone responsible? How about the munitions or the weapons manufacturers? who financed him? Did an apathetic German population share the blame? But then a man came forward out of the crowd and says, do you want to know who is really to blame for the suffering that we've been through? He shouted, I'll tell you. He said, God is to blame. God is to blame. He is the one that created this world. He is the one that has left it be what it is. And soon, everyone on stage is echoing the same indictment. God is to blame. God is to blame. And so what they did was they put God on trial. They put God on trial for the crime of creating the world, and he's found guilty. The judge sentences God to what he considers to be the worst of all sentences. He sentenced God to live on earth as a human being. 
Three archangels are given the task of carrying out this sentence. The first archangel walks to the end of the stage and says, I'm going to see to it when God serves his sentence that he knows what it's like to be obscure and to be poor. He will be born on the backside of nowhere with a peasant girl for his mother. There will be a suspicion of shame about his birth. He will have to live as a Jew in a Jew-hating world. The second archangel adds to that harsh penalty. I'm going to see to it when God serves his sentence that he knows what it's like to fail, to suffer disappointment. No one will ever understand what he's trying to do. And the last archangel said, I'm going to see to it when God serves his sentence that he knows what it's like to suffer. I'm going to see to it that all, he has all kinds of physical pain. And at the end of his life, he's going to be absolutely executed in as painful a way as possible. And suddenly the three archangels disappear and the house lights uh, of the play, the theater, go down. And the audience is left for a few moments in complete darkness. And as they're left in darkness, reality draws upon them. Each member of the audience realized that God has already served his sentence. You see, he knew this is Jesus, what it's like to be obscure and to be poor. He knew what it's like to fail and to suffer disappointment. He knew, church, what it's like to suffer an excruciating death. And he experienced it all in the life and death of Jesus Christ. See, Jesus is the answer to humanity's suffering and sin. And he has come down, church. He has come down. But the sad thing is, the world has yet to receive him. The world has yet to receive him. For you see, church, what he offers us is himself alone. Jesus offers us himself. People often tell me, Pastor, we want hope. Well, let me tell you, Jesus is hope. He is the hope. We want peace. Well, Jesus is the peace. We want love. Well, Jesus is love. See, the problem is we want hope, but we don't want him. We want peace, but we don't want him. We want love, but we don't want him. We want to achieve a world without suffering or sin, but we do not want to open our lives up so that Jesus could begin his healing and reconciling us through him. I mean, church, as I close, there is no other way. There is no other way. Because without him, there is no hope. There is no peace. There is no love available to this world. Without Jesus Christ, who has already come down. He's already come down, church. This is why a little girl named Annika, four years of age, she's fascinated by the basket filled with scraps of fabric left over from her mother's recent sewing project. Little Annika decided to root through the scraps of fabric to retrieve some brightly colored scraps for herself. She took the scraps out to the back garden. Her mother found her little girl sitting on the grass with a long pole. Annika was affixing the scraps of cloth to the top of the pole with these great sticky wads of tape. The mum says, what are you doing, Annika? She says, I'm making a banner. She said, we need a procession so that God will come down. And with that... Her mother lifted her banner to flutter in the wind so that God would come down. 
Now, when I read that church, the idea of God coming down to earth to be with his children, Isaiah the prophet prayed in Isaiah 64 and verse 1, Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down. Isaiah prayed. Well, let me tell you this morning, the first Sunday in Advent, amen, that prayer was answered because Jesus has come down. Now, all we have to do is to receive him. To receive him. To make him known to a sin-filled and suffering world. And I ask you this morning, have you really received him? Because there are people that have only partially received him. You've allowed him to come into that part of your life, but not that part. Jesus wants all of you, not part of you. And I challenge you this morning. Jesus has come down and he wants all of you. Will you receive him today? And with that, I'd like every head bowed and every eye closed in this place. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Isaiah prayed, oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down. And we know from this morning's message that that prayer was answered. The Jews are still looking for him. They've missed it. He has already come down. But let's be honest, they're not alone. There's a lot of people that don't realize that Jesus has already come down. He's already come down. And he wants to be a part of your life. He wants to be a part of you. Will you... Will you receive him today? Will you receive him in church today? Those of you watching online, will you receive Jesus wholeheartedly today? Not just part of you, all of you. Because that's what Christ wants. He's already come down. And I wonder this morning at the sound of my voice, some of you here today, you know that God's only got part of you. He hasn't got all of you. God wants all of you. Will you receive him today? Will you receive him? Those of you online, will you receive him? Will you be willing to repent and invite Jesus into your heart? Will you be willing this morning to say, God, uh, I know you've come down. And I'm sorry that I haven't allowed you access to all of my heart. And God, today I want to receive you now. Or perhaps you could pray the prayer that's on your screen today. You could repent of your sins and invite him in. Those of you here this morning, how is your heart? How is your relationship with Jesus? Because he has come down. He's come down, church. And he's here right now. And he wants full access into your heart. Would you give him that this morning? If you would, then we're going to open up these altars so you can come and speak to God this morning. And yes, we understand there are times, church, where you have felt, God, where are you? Where are you when... I lost my baby. Where were you when I got diagnosed with cancer? Where were you when a family member passed away? 
Well, I'm telling you, God is always there. He has come down. And sometimes we don't understand. But I do know that when we are weak, he is strong. And I know many times uh, it's actually him that's carrying us through and we don't realize it because he's already come down. In our struggles, in our sins, he's trying to carry us through. The problem of it is, many of us, we blame God. We blame God because we haven't given him all of us. We haven't given him our full heart. We want to keep part of our heart to sin, to our workplace, to our families. Well, I'm telling you now, God wants all of you. He wants every part of you. Will you receive him now? These altars are open, church. You come and speak to God this morning at this altar. And maybe you can reference of some areas in your life where you've wondered where God is. And you can testify now and say, God, I know that you was there because you've come down. You've come down and you've touched. You carried me through the, the difficulty, the trauma, the disappointment. You've helped me through those times. I remember as a teenager, 14 years of age, weeping in my bedroom. And I couldn't understand life. Weeping and thinking to myself at 14 years of age, what is the whole point of life? My mom was dying. I'd seen for years her struggles, and yet she loved Jesus. I'd seen my dad worry, anxious, juggling, work, family, hospital time, finances. And I came to that decision at 14 years of age. God, if you're real, where are you? Because I don't see it. And actually, I begin to weep and think, what is the point of life? To die at the end. Why is that? Because I hadn't realized that Jesus has already come down. I hadn't realized that he had come down. And I hadn't given him my life. Because that's what happens when you don't submit to God, when you don't give Jesus your life, you won't have an answer for the ups and downs of life. And even now, through the trials and struggles, I have someone that I can go to. His name is Jesus, because he's already come down. I can speak to him at any time. He'll listen to me. But I have to receive him. I have to give him all of me. And that's the challenge this morning. God wants to come down for all. And even though we live in a world that rejects him at the moment, God uses us to tell the world that he has already come down. He's already here making a difference. And he can make a difference in your life if you would let him, in Jesus' name. Hallelujah.
so God that is Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Just remember, Jesus wants all of you. Not part of you. Some of you are very young. Jesus wants all of your heart. Some of you are like me, getting on a bit in years. God still wants all of my heart. And I'm telling you, when you understand and you give him all of you, and your relationship with him will be so much better. And you'll have a better understanding of life. So let's make sure when people say, well, you know, God needs to come down and sort out this mess. You can tell them he's already come down. He's already come down. He's in my heart and he can be in yours. But you have to allow it. So let's be testimonies. Let's share the good news. And let's be in our place tonight. We have service again tonight, 5.30. The building's open for prayer. 6.30, our service begins tonight. Uh, don't forget morning prayer, Monday through to Friday. Thursday night, we have our midweek service. Please come and join with us. Uh, let others know that it's safe in church. There's plenty of room. Uh, I know some people are away this weekend. They couldn't make it. Uh, but listen, we're opening up the nursery uh, for feeding mothers, so you can bring your families with you. Uh, and uh, I'm sure that uh, many of you have asked me, when are we opening up nursery for mums to feed and change? Uh, well, we're making that available now. And so you then have no excuse not to come. And so I really do encourage you to come. Do not forsake the gathering of the saints. And so let's join together. Amen. Let's be in our place tonight, Thursday, next weekend. Uh, as we all prepare for Christmas. Amen. The reason for the season, amen, uh, is Jesus. So let's make sure, amen, we're in the house of God. Can you say amen? Let's bow our heads. Let's close our eyes as, as Brother Tulalupe. If you would close us uh, in a word of prayer this morning, please. Amen. Be blessed. Love one another. Amen. Remember, you can't fellowship in here. You have to vacate the building, please. Uh, amen. Thank you so much for coming out this morning. Uh, really do appreciate every single one of you uh, that made the effort to come out this morning. God bless you. Stay safe uh, and see you later on. God bless you.